Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Paulson. I'm a reporter covering theater for The New York Times. Welcome to Offstage, our digital series exploring theater during this pause in performances. In this episode, we're going to talk with some of theater's most illustrious stars, plus one of its most famous fans, about their relationship to theater, what they miss, how they think this tumultuous time affects the art form that we all love. Later, we'll talk with four amazing actors, Audra McDonald, Neil Patrick Harris, Danielle Brooks, and Jesse Mueller. We'll hear what they're up to and what they're thinking about. But first, Hillary Rodham Clinton, who you know as a former First Lady, Secretary of State, and presidential candidate, but who is also a lifelong theater lover. Since the 2016 election, she has seen 39 plays and musicals on Broadway and off, plus Hamilton in Puerto Rico. Earlier this week, we talked by Zoom, of course, about theater's meaning, its absence, and its future. Secretary Clinton, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, Michael. I'm really looking forward to talking about the theater and uh, what its loss means to not just the city and culture, but to each of us individually. I wanted to start by asking you a little about the context. Obviously, we're speaking in the middle of a pandemic, there's a presidential campaign, there are wildfires in the West. Is it okay to be thinking about and talking about art now? It's more than okay. I think it's necessary. Um, you know, art is not a luxury. It is a necessity, a necessity to feed, you know, the human spirit and mind, but also uh, to undergird culture and the questions we ask ourselves. In a way, culture precedes democracy or any form of governance. And so the stories that we tell ourselves in our democracy also really matter. And you mention a pandemic, a presidential election, wildfires. There are stories that are competing in helping us to understand and cope with each of those. And therefore, I think in a way, we need theater more now than ever because we need to be reminded that we are all uh, part of a bigger story. And, and for me, the bigger story right now is how we see ourselves, how we treat each other, how we care for each other, how we govern ourselves. And we need, you know, we need art to help guide us because there are very conflicting points of view right now. I'm so glad to hear you say that because like so many of the people who are watching, I miss theater. I know you do too. I wanted to ask you just to begin to tell me a little about your earliest exposures to theater. How did you become a theater goer? Did you go as a kid? When I was in sixth grade, I actually wrote a play. I wrote a play about uh, five girls. Really, it was me and my four best friends in Mrs. Uh, King's uh, sixth grade class uh, going to Europe. And, and she actually let us produce it. So in sixth grade, my friends and I produced the sort of school play, and that was a treat. But I didn't really get exposed to or get to do much in the way of going to theater until I was in college. And I did start going to the theater then and even made a couple of trips to New York. Uh, famously uh, stood in line uh, for standing room only for hair. That was the first Broadway production that I'd ever seen. And they didn't let us in, Michael, until intermission. <laughs> and then we had to stand in the back, but it was still thrilling. Uh, and I was hooked uh, ever since. Uh, I understand you were in a few shows during high school. Well, yes, but only if I didn't sing. That was so humiliating, Michael. I mean, I loved, you know, the idea of the theater even then when I hadn't seen anything. Oh, I had, I did start collecting albums. Some of your viewers may remember albums. And... I asked for some albums for um, my, you know, my birthday or for Christmas. I, I think I wore out Camelot. I found that, you know, just so romantic and uh, when I was a, you know, young girl. Um, so in high school, um, my high school was staging Bye Bye Birdie. And um, 
one of the um, one of my really good friends was in it, and they needed more people in the chorus. And I knew the drama teacher. He and I I took a drama class when I was in high school. So uh, we went. I went to the tryouts for the chorus, and he was a kind of friend of mine. And he goes, "Well, I'll tell you what, Hillary." you can be in the production as long as you don't actually sing. <laughs> you, you can mouth the words, but I really did and still have just a pretty sad voice um, for singing. And so that was out. You also sort of reintroduced yourself to theater after 2016. We started to see you a lot in the audience on Broadway. Uh, I think you've gone to 39 shows uh, <laughs> since since that election. Is it uh, an escape? Is it therapy? What's the rationale? I really needed to get replenished. I felt so drained uh, and hollowed out by the 2016 election. Everything that happened, it seemed so, it seemed like a almost a very bad, <laughs> very bad play. I mean, one, you know, one thing after another, cue the Russians, cue Comey, cue WikiLeaks, you know, it just never seemed to end. And so I did, um, I think, seek solace as well as replenishment by going to the theater quite often after the 2016 election. And did you, did you, did you find it? I did. I did. Now, I will tell you that the first couple of times that I went, um, it was very uh, uh, challenging and even a little painful because, you know, there were so many people who came up to see me, who wanted to share their feelings about the election. There were people who came, I think, seeking absolution, particularly young women, young in their maybe late teens, early 20s. One was literally dragged to my seat during intermission by her mother, who forced her to tell me that she hadn't voted because she thought I didn't need her vote, and, and she wanted to tell me she was so sorry. So it became not only what was happening on the stage, but what was happening in my interactions with a lot of the people uh, who were at the theater as well. Um, but it was, you know, very, you know, it was very well-meaning and I, you know, I appreciated, you know, the outreach uh, from so many. So how do you choose what to see? I was looking at the list of things you've seen and some of them are these big musicals that are super entertaining. Like I think you saw Ain't Too Proud, which is about the Temptations a couple of times. And then you also are seeing small off-Broadway shows. You saw something called In the Body of the World, which is a one-woman show about cancer. There's quite a range. And I wonder how you put it together. Well, I, I really do want to sort of experience the range. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, I want to see the big productions because, uh, you know, that's always uh, kind of a lift and fun and, you know, going to see Dolly with Bette Midler, it can't, doesn't get much better than that. Um, but I also want to see uh, a, a broader uh, range of, um, theater and, and, as you say, off-Broadway as well. You know, thinking about everything that I've seen, I mean, you know, when um, I saw Three Tall Women, I was just blown away. I, I was stunned by how uh, powerful that was. And, and I, I know Glenda Jackson because of, you know, mutual friends and, and uh, her long uh, service in politics. You know, she was actually in the parliament for more than 25 years, I think. Um, so, you know, getting to see her, getting to talk with her about that play, I went to see her in King Lear, which, you know, was such an, uh, an unusual performance uh, and staging. When I saw The Ferryman, I could not get out of my seat because I'd been involved with the um, peace process in, in Northern Ireland and just the rawness of that story. And I know people, I, I understand a lot of what uh, they went through during the trouble. So that was powerful theater, but also personally really resonant. When I saw the band's visit, I was, you know, really touched by the story. You know, when I saw Come From Away, having been Senator on 9-11, it was, you know, just, uh, touching and, and, and very 
joyful remembrance of such a horrible experience. Uh, and, you know, I could go on and on. So for me, I, I look for things that I'd be interested in or actors that I want to see, topics that I find intriguing, you know, what the Constitution meant to me, I thought was brilliant uh, and so timely. I wanted to ask you about um, mothering, because one thing we know about theater going is that for many people it's learned from their parents. Did you try to introduce Chelsea to theater going? What was your thinking about that? Absolutely. I mean, she, like me, loved musical um, scores. And, you know, we listened to a lot of that uh, growing up. I think it was her 16th birthday where uh, we took her to Les Miserables, uh, which was then um, in Washington. And then we started coming to New York uh, to see uh, theater, even maybe when she was younger. Um, Secret Garden, I remember, you know, bringing her uh, to the theater uh, whenever we could. She has continued that. She loves the theater, goes regularly. And then for my granddaughter's fifth birthday, um, she and her mom and I uh, took her to see Frozen, which of course, you know, was like the most amazing thing. Uh, and she, she was just wide-eyed and the, you know, it was a matinee and the theater was filled with little kids, uh, a lot of them dressed up in uh, their, you know, frozen costumes. Uh, so yes, I think that uh, passing down the importance of theater, if you love it as much as I do, is just sharing something that you care deeply about. So we, we have some questions from people who've signed up to watch this. Brittany wants to know of all the shows you've seen, do you have a favorite? Oh, Brittany, I, I have a favorite. I have a favorite for so many different reasons. Um, you know, I, 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 I can pick out pieces of it. But, you know, some of the, the plays that I just mentioned are favorites because of the way that I connected with them. Um, and some performances like Hades Town. I just, you know, I, I loved Hades Town and I loved. Uh, Andre Shields, who won the Tony Award, I thought, you know, th there was just something about it, you know, the mythology and bringing it into the, into the, you know, present time. So how, to ask you a question that kind of um, challenges all of us who see a lot of theater, how do you decide who to bring? How do you decide when you bring Bill or Chelsea or a friend <laughs> or? There are a group of people that I've gone to the theater uh, with off and on for a long time, but then there are people who come from out of town and, um, Lots of times my friends who come to see me, you know, they have a particular show in mind that they want to go to. So just the last, the last, uh, one of the last things I saw before the shutdown um, was the Tina Turner uh, musical, which I thought was so much fun. And uh, of course, you know, again, somebody from my entire life. Uh, and I went with um, like six of my friends uh, from out of town, you know, that they were coming to New York. And so we, you know, we're going to have dinner together. We were going to go shopping together. And that's what they wanted to see because, you know, Tina Turner was a big part of their growing up too. So it, it varies. It, it's a kind of rolling, um, uh, rolling experience. And as you know, I have a wonderful uh, theater critic uh, close to me, uh, Rob Russo, who is uh, one of my longest serving colleagues. And sometimes Rob goes with me. You know, we saw Fiddler in the Roof in Yiddish, which was amazing. And, you know, several of my friends had said, hey, you, need to, you need to see this. And I thought, well, you know, I don't understand Yiddish. And they said, oh, believe me, you're, you're, you're going to be blown away by it. I think one of the shows we haven't talked about yet is Hamilton, which I think you saw off Broadway and on Broadway and then in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. you talk about why you think that show uh, has resonated so much with you and with so many others? You know, um, I, I, I had known Lin-Manuel Miranda for a number of years. His father is a good friend of mine. And I'd seen In the Heights, which I enjoyed very much. And I love the public theater. I mean, just the sheer audacity of 
portraying Alexander Hamilton and the founders, uh, the story of America's beginning in the way with the cast in a rap um, uh, lyric, it was just brilliant. I think I've seen it, uh, I don't know, three additional times on Broadway. And then Bill and I were in Puerto Rico after the terrible damage of the hurricanes, the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Global Initiative were working uh, with Puerto Ricans to reestablish services and to provide uh, a lot of help. And so we coordinated our visit to go when uh, Hamilton was still uh, being performed in um, San Juan and it was electric. You know, in each of the different settings that I saw Hamilton in public theater, on Broadway, in Puerto Rico, it, it filled the, not only the physical space, but the space of imagination uh, in a way that was different, but equally compelling. So one unusual thing about your relationship to the theater is that sometimes now you're a character. Uh, you're an important historical figure and a few uh, dramatists have started writing about you. Uh, I wonder, uh, last year we saw um, a play called Hillary and Clinton that imagined your 2008 campaign in an alternate universe. And then there was a musical called Soft Power that uh, featured a character named Hillary Rodham Clinton who dances and sings and eats a lot of ice cream. Did you see? <laughs> well, you know, in my house, the dancing, singing, eating ice cream does go on, I have to say. I can't, I, I have not had the courage to go see anything about me. Um, you know, sometimes in a pre-existing um, production, somebody will say something or, you know, have a, have a reference uh, to me. And I obviously catch that. But to go and see a play about me, I, I haven't gotten, you know, I haven't gotten the gumption up to do that yet. <laughs> I think the weekend before Broadway shut down, you saw The Inheritance. I did. And, uh, that's a two-part play about two generations of gay men in New York. There are scenes around your election. There's a brunch where they're talking about the expectation that you'll win, and then they're watching the results and not happy with how it's going. I wonder what it was like to sit through that. It was uh, painful um, because we all know now um, what we've had to live through over the last uh, nearly four years and the, you know, the pain and real suffering that so many Americans have felt um, was potent uh, to see the end of that first long act of the inheritance uh, be sort of circled around my loss was incredibly uh, touching and, and, as I say, painful to me. So, as you know, uh, this is a really difficult time for artists financially. Do you think the government has a role to play in helping people who work in the arts through this pandemic? Yes, absolutely. You know, I don't understand uh, why a second uh, large recovery package hasn't already passed the Congress. You know, they certainly have time to rush through an ill-advised uh, Supreme Court uh, nomination, and they don't have time to take up the act that was passed in the House called the HEROES Act that was really ended up being bipartisan to try to provide more economic relief, and not just to individuals and not just to businesses, but to local governments and states and included in the broad category of people who should be um, given support right now uh, are artists. And, you know, I think it's more than fair to say that New York's recovery to a, a significant extent uh, is tied with the recovery of the arts, with the return of you know, Broadway, off-Broadway, other uh, performances and productions. And there's a huge economic contribution, if you will, that comes from the, uh, the vibrancy of New York City uh, that needs to be uh, carefully, uh, you know, taken care of and, and hopefully restarted as soon as possible. 
I know you've spent a lot of time in your career thinking about the issue of racial justice, uh, which obviously has had a lot of focus, intensified focus this year, and it's reverberating in the theater world. I wonder if you have advice for theater industry leaders who are grappling with concerns about equity. <clears throat> well, first, I'm glad they're grappling uh, because it's like the moral reckoning that we are facing around uh, racial justice and equity issues, it's long overdue. Everyone would, I think, admit that. And, you know, I do believe there has to be a, a, an intentional effort. It can't be just uh, well-meaning, uh, aspirational. There has to be an intentional effort. And, you know, there are lots of good ideas that are being put forth now about how to make the theater more diverse. And not only the um, you know, the, the actors and the stagehands and everyone who puts on the production, but the audience. I mean, going back to Hamilton, one of the really great gifts that Hamilton gave was to have um, free performances for uh, New York City high school kids. And so you had this very diverse audience of young people, because that's what the New York City school system is, able to see Hamilton, they never would have been able to before. And who knows what that might spark among those young people. So I think more productions need to do more outreach and create more diverse audiences. And then of course, when it comes to, uh, you know, reaching out to playwrights and actors and, uh, you know, script writers, uh, score writers, whoever, is part of a production, cast a wider net, um, you know, be more adventurous, be more, you know, provocative, see what's out there. And I guess the final thing I would say is, and, you know, every one of us um, has to ask ourselves, you know, are we free of, you know, implicit bias? You know, let, let's try to move beyond you know, the stereotypes and the quick decisions about, well, that won't sell or that won't make it. We don't know that. Let's try it. And I think audiences will be much more receptive uh, now than perhaps they were in the past. What do you think will make you feel comfortable going back into a theater? Are you going to hold out for a vaccine? Would you go in the moment that Governor Cuomo says theaters can open? What is it that you think would make you comfortable going back to Broadway? I think I'm going to be cautious. Um, I think that there are ways of learning how to do this. A couple of um, instances of successful returns to the theater, both outside and then very socially distanced inside, have been successful in Europe and then a few around the United States. Um, but I think I'd have to be sure that you know what was being uh, produced and presented uh, had taken uh, every precaution, and I think that's going to take a while. I'm going to wait and watch very carefully. Allegra asked a question I wish I had thought of, which is, would you ever be a Broadway producer yourself? Well, um, you never know, Allegra. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm certainly open to it. You know, I've, I've got a podcast starting today. I'm um, interested in you know, producing uh, good content, because as I said at the very beginning, I think it matters what stories are told, uh, who the stories are about, um, and I want to be part of that in some way, so stay tuned. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you so much, Michael, and thanks to all your viewers. You know, keep the faith. <laughs> we, have to, we have to believe that it's going to come back and it's going to be just as great uh, as it always was. Before we get to our live roundtable, I know that many of us, like Secretary Clinton, are missing live theater. That's why we asked you to send us pictures from your theater lives, and so many of you did. Here are some of them.
Hey everyone, we're back. And I am so honored to be joined tonight by a group of truly amazing performers. Danielle Brooks, Neil Patrick Harris, Audra McDonald, and Jesse Mueller. Welcome everyone. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hey. So let's start with our evening theme. We're now six months into a pandemic that has shuttered Broadway indefinitely and has made the performing arts, which is your chosen career, largely impossible. Tell us what you miss most. Why don't we start with you, Jesse? Um, I dare you start with me, I'm kidding. Um, I miss the live energy exchange, I do. With the audience. Danielle? Hey everybody. <laughs> um, I definitely the same. I miss feeling the audience. I miss um, the tribal family feel of all of us together creating something. Uh, I miss the process. I miss, oh, this is one of my favorite things, is when you're outside and you roll up and there's a huge line of people waiting to get into your show and you trying to calm your nerves down, but you excited about what is about to take place. That, I just love it. So those are a few things. <laughs> what about you, Neil? Same, I, there's something about, I mean, everyone watches TV at home and you can do that while other things are going on and everyone can go watch a movie, but sometimes you do it just because you've got a free night. But there's something about going to the theater that feels special. And it is, it, it, it is feel, it feels like as an audience, you get to watch a family of people doing something seemingly for the first time. And there's something so um, enthralling about the intimacy of that, even though you're all doing it together. And then on the other side, when you're part of that family, the process that Danielle speaks of is so, so special, and it and it and it's 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 not the same when you're doing another medium when you're working on film or TV. It's just a different vibe. Everyone every night, like athletes, are working together for a singular goal that may change and usually does. And everyone's watching for those magical moments, right? And, and so it's that kind of exchange of, of, of uniqueness, even though what everyone's doing on stage is pretty much set that I find just intoxicating. Audra? I, I would agree with what everyone has said. I think the only thing I would add to it, or maybe just my own words to it, is I miss, I'm, I, I refer to it as this, maybe because I was raised Episcopalian, I don't know, I miss the holy communion between the audience and the performers. There is, you, we all go in, you know, as separate people and we all become one, having, experiencing a moment. And maybe it's a moment where someone falls down on stage or falls in love on stage or, you know, an audience member reacts, whatever it is, it's all so, it's ephemeral. It, 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 it all happens right there in the moment and you're forced to be in that moment and you're forced to be in that moment with mm -hmm. this group of people that you will never all be together with again. And there's something so magical about that that then forces everybody to sort of, um, we, we kind of all start to beat with one heart our humanity mm. comes through as that one sort of being. We become this one thing. And then everybody, you know, walks out the stage door and mm -hmm. goes out the front doors to the theater and then you're back into your own lives. But for one moment, we all had this communion that was holy and, and connects us. And I miss that. I miss church. It's church mm. for me. <laughs> I want to ask you guys a little about your own relationships to theater. How did you become theater people? Who wants to go first? Audra, you, you can start. Oh dear. Well, theater, uh, I mean, I, I come from a family of musicians and uh, singers in my family. My dad was a, a he was a, a, a music teacher. Both of my grandmothers taught piano. All my aunts sang and still sing. And um, so there was always music in our house and in my, in my parents' sort of quest to find something to focus me because I had such issues with hyperactivity as a child. Um, 
they found this theater company in Fresno, California, and 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 said this might be something that she would enjoy because she's always singing and jumping around the house and uh, and uh, being very dramatic about everything. And I was basically like winning an Oscar every thirty seconds in my house when I was like six, seven, and eight years old. So um, they encouraged me to audition. I auditioned, and I ended up with that theater company until I graduated high school. And the rest is history. And that's where I found it and fell in love with it and um, found um, a place for my energy and, and realized that my energy plugged in perfectly yeah. to this world. Yeah. Danielle, I think you were <laughs> in there. Uh, yeah, because I was going to piggyback on uh, what Ms. Audra said about church. It's definitely started there for me. Um, so I was six years old when I was in my first church play, uh, and everybody was saying I was good. So my mom just kept finding put, like programs in the community to put me in. But there was just this magic moment when you're in church where people are moved, you know, people are being transformed. And that's exactly what happens with theater. And it, to, to the T for me, it, where you have a playbill, you have a program in church, you have the choir, that's the ensemble, you have the preacher, he's like running the show, you know, everything, mm -hmm. it just clicked so well when I found the theater. Um, and it wasn't until I went to a high school, Governor's School for Arts and Humanities in South Carolina, uh, that I studied there for two years that I realized, oh, I can do this like for real, like, I can go to school for this. Um, had no idea that that existed. And um, all of the chocolate girls uh, were getting into Juilliard, didn't know what that was, but I was like, they look like me, we can figure this out. And uh, I got into Juilliard and that's how that happened. And so, yeah, that's why representation matters. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was my playground. It was my church and it started there for me. You know, we know you started young. How did, how did you get into this strange world? I started young, but you know, I've always, I've always looked at the theater performer as the most, um, vibrant and talented and i think it's because i grew up in small town new mexico where it was very football centric and there was not theater really to be spoken of and i sang in the episcopal choir when i was eight and they were with adults because i was just this precocious little gay kid and uh and then i i wound up doing like a movie and then tv shows and and always admiring the theater people the first movie I ever did, the first big thing I ever did was this Whoopi Goldberg vehicle called Clara's Heart. And she had told me about this musical called Phantom of the Opera. And she had got me, she took me into her bus because she travels by bus. And she showed, she played the CD of Phantom of the Opera and showed me this giant book that was the Michael Crawford, you know, the hardbound Phantom of the Opera comedendum or whatever. And there was the picture of what he looked like without the, and I was a hook, line and sinker. How does this even happen? And even before then, I had listened to Les Miserables. And so like th th this was my initiation to the theater. So even as I kept working in other mediums, I would all, I have just such a talent crush on what these people do. And I have been lucky in being able sometimes to host the Tony Awards and be able to then like authentically really tell people how amazing these unique performers are. So my mine came from a weird way, I mean, Danielle and Audra went to Juilliard. J Jesse went to Syracuse. I didn't go to college. Like my theater background is just from wanting to do it and trying it and figuring it out. And I've gotten really exciting opportunities, but I still always, even still, feel like kind of the outsider enamored by these people and what they're mm -hmm. able to. The first thing I ever saw, I'm gonna go on a little tantrum and ty tirade and then tirade aside and then just <laughs> i was in la with my father and we saw fences at the mark tape forum and it was james earl jones and lynn thigpen was his wife and i couldn't be whiter and i was there from small town new mexico and i'm sitting watching in this in la and we're seeing fences and i don't know this world really 
and I didn't know this family. And I was so emotional. I remember being like 11 or 12 years old and I was just crying. Lynn Thigpen is peeling potatoes and she's got this really long monologue in the second act where she's icy and she explains it all. And, and, and the, she was so intimate and it was so focused and I am, I was not like her and I felt so much like I understood her soul and I did it at all. And, and I think that speaks to the church and the community of it all. I was not even the right age. I was not even the right like demographic. And I was completely taken by the story and felt like I had left a, a learned person. And this was mm -hmm. like one of my first things I ever saw. And so from that point forward, mm -hmm. I appreciated the power of the theater. And, and so that's been sort of my track. That was a long answer, sorry. Wow. Jesse, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> sorry. I know, I know, I, I guess I kind of came to it, to me it almost felt like home. My parents are, my parents are actors. I grew up just outside of Chicago. And so I grew up going to theater from a, like a really young age. I think the first play I saw, I was four. I went to a musical when I was four. I mean, I don't know who, I don't know what my parents were thinking. I guess I was fairly well behaved because, um, but, and, and, um, and then I would go, so we just saw a lot of theater because it was mom and dad's job. So looking back now, I think I was also fascinated by theater people who at the time were just mom and dad's friends, but I was exposed to all these really wonderful, eccentric, interesting people when I was really tiny and I was just, I was just taken away by it. I, I think I had that feeling of kind of like Neil said, and, and like both of you ladies said that the, the communion of it, the communion community of it, of watching something and going, oh my gosh, I don't know anything about that, but I, but I feel it. And then I think as I got a little older, my little mind was like, what if I, what if I could do that? What if I could make somebody feel something or cleanse someone or feel mm -hmm. release or, or whatever the emotion happens to be. So I think but it, I guess, so it, it came in like, it, to me, it was a natural way because it just felt normal. It, it just was part of, it was kind of part of our daily life growing up, my, my brothers and my sister. And I. So let's turn for a moment to the subject of money. Many, many people who work in the performing arts, not just actors, but designers mm -hmm. and box office workers and stagehands and so many more are now out of work. How well or poorly do you think the industry, the government, and our society are doing at helping arts workers through this crisis? Well, I'll start. <laughs> yeah, how do we begin? Go for it, Audra. Um, I think what we need more of, um, I, I, and maybe that's my answer in, in terms of how well I think they're doing, I think what people don't realize is how much, especially you know, in New York, but in other communities as well, how many, uh, what a village it takes to, to, to um, make the performing arts work and how many people are um, employed by the performing arts. It's not just the actors. So when people say, ah, oh, yeah, well, sorry, you actors don't have a job right now. Like, like you said, Michael, it's, it's the box office people. It's the, it's the restaurants surrounding these theaters and all the waiters and the, and the bus boys. It's the, it's the, um, it's the, 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 uh, the, the contractors that go in. It's the, it's the suppliers. It's the, it's the, the house cleaning. It's, it's everybody. It's the whole community when you think about it. And so that we are all affected and not just the actors on stage. I think, um, more people need to realize how much it, it affects all of those people and then therefore affects the economy of that particular community, whatever it is. Because if those people don't have money, there aren't people coming in to spend their money and then um, the trickle down in the bad way happens. But I think a lot of people need to adjust their thinking into thinking it just means that actors are out of work. Mm hmm You all- I really- Yep, go ahead. Can I just say, I appreciated so much what what Mrs. Clinton was saying. It, it's just so, 
I guess I'm I'm always sort of pleasantly surprised when I hear people really express their love of theater, express their appreciation of theater. I think sometimes on the inside, there's this thought that oh well it's just theater it doesn't it doesn't have a bigger impact it doesn't have a global impact it doesn't have an impact on the community but it really does it's important mm -hmm. to so many people and and it's i mean i am fascinated to see the the art that's going to be created about this time you know what i mean the plays that will be written about this time that we will see later on and what that's going to be like and how artists are going to reflect on this time because that's that's what artists do best is is take on what is happening in the world and um, but, and I think sometimes people like, like Audra said, people think like it doesn't affect the economy because it's this, it's this, it's this little small section. It's not a big blockbuster movie or it's not this or it's not that, but it's, um, there's nothing else like it. And we've all been on zoom every day, many hours a day. We've all watched almost everything that's on all the streaming channels. The, the live energy exchange, it's like, that's what, if anything I hope is coming out of this time, it's that we realize how precious theater is. We mm. realize how precious live performance is. And it's just, it's, it has extreme value. So it's, it's kind of, I found it many times in my life, it's, it's often tricky to feel valued in this field. And right now, when, especially when so many of us aren't working, um, that's, that is very real, but but I but I hope that people will realize the extreme value that this kind of artistry does have and the impact it does have. So that when it comes back, people people will be investing in it in a big way. Read it's valuable in a way that that I think a lot of people don't fathom, and that you both recognize super super well because we live in a hella divisive world right now. And if there's any way for people to be united by a singular experience, whether it be mm -hmm. fun and dancers and sets that move around, or whether it be a, a, a singular voice that causes you to think in different ways that you didn't believe before, having like making a moment of going to do that, I think, and regardless of who, what you think and where you live and who you are, I think that that community is valuable. I think the, 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 the theater community, the acting community is valuable, but I think almost more valuable is the theater watching community because they can leave experiences changed and they can also leave their personal biases and experiences aside for a minute and sit next to someone that they may vehemently disagree with but you can all enjoy Bette Midler together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think there's great value in that, you know? So the theater industry is not only confronting a pandemic, but also all these questions about racial justice that uh, are pervasive in our uh, entire culture and have intensified this year. I wonder, how you would like Broadway to change when it does come back and maybe not just Broadway, the theater world generally. And Audra, if I can put you on the spot, I think I'll start with you because I know you're one of the founders of a new organization called Black Theater United and you've been working on these issues. Yes, well, I, I, you know, um, I have to say I was really disheartened to hear um, people in our administration saying that, among other things, systemic racism doesn't exist. And that in and of itself <laughs> is already showing how, how systemic it is. If there are certain people that are not oppressed can say, well, that oppression doesn't even exist. So I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself is, is a, a problem. But uh, Black Beauty United, um, basically what we're looking to do is to address systemic racism on the macro and the micro level. So the macro level is, you know, uh, throughout this country and, um, and ways we can go about uh, fixing that. And one of the ways is civic engagement, making sure that we are all actually um, taking part in, um, in our democracy um, and voting and registering for the census and, and voting in local elections and um, making sure you know who the candidates are, making sure you, you know, know who's running for sheriff, the school board, things like that. 
Um, and then as far as uh, the theater, the micro for Black Beauty United, one of the things that we're looking at is representation. And, and as Danielle said, how important that is. And so that doesn't mean just on stage and the people we're seeing in the shows, like, like um, uh, Secretary Clinton said as well. Um, you need to make sure that you have representation backstage, that there are more um, BIPOC people and Black people and Brown people and people of color in the um, stage management departments, in the, 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 the unions, the wardrobe union, the hair and makeup union, the IOTC. Mm -hmm. And then you need to make sure that we're having uh, diversity within sort of the casting scene so that it's not just making sure that you're seeing diverse people for roles, but you have diverse people casting them. Um, diversity within um, producers and, and um, playwrights and, and in all the creative teams as well. And then um, diversity, again, diversifying your audience. And, and when you build it, they will come. <laughs> you really will. Mm -hmm. And so um, we need to be making sure that, sure that the stories that are being told are stories that are representative of, of all people, um, not just you know one particular story. So you need to make sure, and something that Sherilyn Eiffel said, um, a lot of times uh, we need to make sure that we are able to have control of our narrative. And that you know when you have more uh, people of color out there telling the stories, that then speaks to what Neil was just talking about. That way, in the way that Lorraine Hansberry you know, wrote about a family in Raisin in the Sun and white people came to see that and said, oh, okay, so this is what black people are. Oh, well, I thought, oh, well, I just don't know any black people. So we're telling all these different diverse stories and we're taking control of the narrative and we're um, showing our humanity in a way that um, a lot of times uh, society can control that narrative in a negative way. And um, uh, so that's, that's a very long-winded answer at the end of a very long day yeah. about uh, some of the things that I feel that need to change within the theater, and um, which is why Black Theater United was created. Do, do any of you think that the events of this year will change the kinds of projects that you want to be involved with going forward? For sure. I think I try to always start from there. Is like whether I'm doing TV, movie, film, cartoon, animated, it's, I'm always trying to say, is this moving us forward? And if it's not, mm -hmm. it's not worth doing. Now, I'm not, I do feel like what Neil was saying, sometimes like you just need something that's not so heavy, <laughs> you know, like let's just see Bette Midler do her thing. Like sometimes you do need lighthearted um, experiences, um, especially when we're dealing with so many heavy issues in the world. Um, and so, so a part of that, sometimes I might take on something that's a little lighthearted. Um, but I do feel like for me, um, it's, is, am I moving us forward, even with the women that look up to me, you know, that, that, um, relate to this dark skin plus size woman, am I moving them forward, um, in the, in the industry? So, um, that's what's important to me when I when I look at projects um, from yeah, and also I just have to uh, just have to do that. That's not, that's not I have <laughs> yeah. you to warn it tonight. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but and that but that's the magic of the theater too, right, Michael? I mean, watching like Jesse was in Carousel with Joshua Henry, who was her Billy, Billy, Billy Bigelow, and he was fantastic as as a performer like i don't even know anyone who could do it like that his his expressions no. and his vocal quality and his humor and his joy and his light and and what a smart decision it wasn't done for any other reason in my opinion than he was like fantastic and he was and that was such a great thing to watch and to have other people get to experience together so there are there are countless people who are wildly talented people of color, actors, of directors, what Audrey was saying, everyone across the board, everyone needs to be represented. And if you're amazing and you can represent it, you must. And the theater is a really fantastic place to be able to do that. Jesse, um, Danielle alluded to the fact that you all are role models for 
various young people who love theater and love you guys. I've been thinking a lot about how this period is affecting young people who dream of making their way in the theater. And mm. obviously there are no jobs uh, and the theater is looking at a kind of tough road ahead. What would you, what kind of advice would you give to young people who are now studying theater and like looking at this scene with dread? I think, I think maybe the blessing that could come out of this is, it's like, be, find your grounding. It's a time where we don't have to be distracted by all the bells and whistles and this person's doing 12 movies and that person I know got this job and that job. It's like, get to work, get down to the root of it. Focus on, I, th I think, uh, to me, this time it has been, well, it's been about many things, but it's been such a time of awakening and focus and stop focusing on BS and let's figure out what's important to all of us and let's figure out how to get along and let's figure out what all makes us human and what all brings us together. And I think that's the kind of stuff that makes a good actor, makes a good artist, makes a good performer. And I think lately too in, in the world, I, I, let's say pre-pandemic, I think a lot of, I've seen a lot of pe young people get caught up in the trappings of, oh, I gotta, I gotta have a, this presence on social media and I have to do this and I have to look like this and I have to sound like this. And, and I just, I hope this time can encourage young people, be authentic, be grounded, be humble, be kind, be real, use your heart use the mind that you were given and the outlook that only you have, be unique, um, because the rest of that stuff doesn't matter. It matters to some people, but in the end, like we're all just trying to get through this time and we're finding out once again, what's really important. So let's not forget that lesson when we're on the other side of this, whatever the new normal is. Um, I know it's, it's, I'm sure it's so frightening. I've talked to a lot of young people who were, you know, were graduating and were supposed to be moving mm -hmm. to New York or supposed to be starting their careers. And, and um, you know, sometimes they, they look to people like us, say on this panel to, you know, say, you know, give us a good word of what we can look forward to or what should I be doing now? And, and I always feel like, honey, I have no idea. I don't know what I'm doing right now, but I, but I do know that you have to hold on to who you are and keep, keep learning who that is. Keep, keep, keeping yourself healthy, mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, that was a long answer, but, but that's the, the essence of it. Like focus on the authenticity and, and, and what makes us human in the work and where the, where the humanity is in the work. And that will, that will shine through, that will shine through. Can I piggyback on that? Just, Please. I think something else Please. that I would say to young people right now is create your own work too. We're in an era now where every, I mean, this, you know, for those of us that can't afford computers and internet and whatnot, we are in an era where it, Zoom has leveled the playing field. So, and I believe that theater can ha happen anywhere where you have an audience and you have a performer. And if Zoom is what it is for right now, then Zoom is what it is. So what I mean by that is you can turn that into something um, charitable and philanthropic, like reach out to a senior citizen's home or an assisted living home right now and get together with a couple of your friends on Zoom and create a showcase for them. Do a cabaret and do it just for the people in a senior citizen's home right now who are, you know, very isolated, you know, as they're trying to keep themselves safe during this pandemic, like all of us are. But that incorporates your skill, it incorporates your heart, it incorporates charitable giving, and it creates theater. So that in and of itself right there, or for, you know, or for, I don't know, I'm thinking about like the kids in the Covenant House or something. There are ways that you can continue yeah. to work on your craft and be um, uh, giving about it and create theater in this sort of whole, whole new realm that we're in. So they're, they're because we are not going anywhere. This is the theater. This is a short blip. This is a myopic, yeah. intense moment. But Grecians, Romans, Shakespearean That's times, true. fires. It's been plays. a while. It's been around. Yeah. <laughs> the theater will come back. This is a theater community. We will always be around to share stories. So if you're isolated, write about it. If you're twitchy and you can't get out of your place, watch a YouTube video about pop and locking like you can have outlets for what you want to do but this <laughs> this theater community is not dead we will we will be back 
sooner, yeah. you know, as, as soon as we're able. Yeah. And that's not because we want to all make money. We will be back because we can't help it. Yeah. And everyone wants to share these stories. But more importantly, Michael, everyone wants to hear these stories. This is why we do this. Great. Yeah. So I want to turn to questions from viewers because believe it or not, we've received more than a thousand questions for you guys. I read oh a lot of them in the wee hours, apparently. Talk I, fast. No. You know, <laughs> I'm talk fast. Um, you know, there are people who love and admire all of you and music and drama and cast albums, but they're also worried. Um, obviously, I can't ask all of them to you, but I want to thank everyone who wrote in and let you know that I'm going to share your questions with my colleagues and hopefully they'll inspire some story ideas. And meanwhile, we'll try to barrel through some of them. I'm gonna sort of randomly pose them to you guys uh, one by one and anyone who wants to can jump in, but don't feel compelled to answer everything. And that way we can keep moving. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, uh, Jesse, you wanna start? Um, Artie from Minnesota wants to know, it feels like the greatest risk for returning to theater is not for the audience, but to actors playing unmasked, often speaking or singing loudly and close to one another to say nothing of scenes depicting intimacy. How can these risks be mitigated? Well, I think it's gonna, it's gonna take time and it's gonna take study and science. And, you know, the, um, the, theater and tel the theater and television industry is already starting to bounce back in film and um, they're getting back to work and they're putting in really amazing protocols and making sure they're doing tests every week and taking people's temperatures and keeping social distancing where and when you can. I mean, the the proximity of people playing scenes together, intimacy, that's something that's gonna be have to have to be worked out. Um, I think having a vaccine is gonna be a huge game changer, but um, I would say that's very kind of you to think about our safety and we appreciate it because we're also really concerned about our audience's safety and our, and our audience feeling comfortable and feeling safe coming back to the theater. So, um, but we're, we're a family in the theater, so we know how to take care of each other. So we're, we'll be on top of that. You don't have to worry. Audra, uh, this is a question from Sabrina from Illinois who wants to know after COVID, can you ever imagine being comfortable stage dooring again? Mm. Sabrina, mm. that is a very interesting question. I have to say stage dooring is um, a particular uh, thing I think as I think I can speak for everybody here in saying there's a part of it that we we love doing because it's so wonderful to get a chance to meet, you know, your fans and your appreciative audience and, and um, to spend time with them. Um, but it's also at the end of us having, you know, either sung our faces off or 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 you know ripped our hearts out, you know, and um, so it's an ex it's an ex exhausting thing as well. Um, but at the same time, it's it's a way for us to thank the fans and the fans to thank us. So I understand the importance of it. Having said that, I would imagine that it is gonna take a while before it's something that um, we feel comfortable doing again. Um, just because everybody uh, everybody's safety is uh, paramount. And so that's not only my safety, but that's like you, Sabrina, that's your safety as well. So um, it's I, I, for me, I know it's going to take a while before I feel super comfortable doing that again. But it, in the meantime, we've got, you know, Twitter, Insta, and other things. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose if everyone wears masks and then you're holding your own pen, that you're not passing pens back and forth and stuff, you could still probably sign with a bit of social distance. I do like signing those autographs because I think that they just saw you. <laughs> like yeah. you just experience this together and there's something special yeah. about that different from just oh you're a recognizable person will you sign a piece of paper which seems very sort of random and those when are you, the stage door people who will stay and wait until you come yeah in. sometimes you've got other people that you need to see or it takes yeah. you to get out of costume and it's i'm always so amazed at some of the kids who are waiting around when it's either still raining or it's yeah. like five yeah. degrees. Like you, I'm always lecturing them, go home to you. I'll stop oh, oh, yeah. button up and take care of your throat. And, um, yeah, if, once we figure out a way to do it safely, it, you know, it will come back. We just have to be safe about it. Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, Danielle, Jesse from Hawaii uh, has a question about this diversity issue. What underrepresented stories do you hope to see when Broadway returns? Everybody. Um, mm -hmm. I forgot the person who asked the question, but hey, um, everyone's story. I mean, I can't pinpoint one exact story or even this two exact stories that I want to be one I want to see told. But I, I, I think sometimes people forget like diversity is not just black. You know, it's not just brown. It's every. It, it it's all facets of religion, sex, uh, sexual preference. It's the list goes on. I age. You know, and I feel like every one story it deserves to be told. So um, that's what that's my answer. <laughs> Uh, Neil, Donna from Massachusetts wants you to get real and tell her what is your real best guess about when live theater comes back? Oh, wow, that's such a great question. These are great questions. Honestly, I hadn't even thought about this signing stuff, what happens there. I hadn't really thought about the intimacy mm -hmm. thing from, yeah. so this, these are all really interesting questions. I know, uh, I know from talking to people that are producers of shows that are happening and um, as someone who's trying to direct a show that is hoping to happen not soon, but later, you know, like I'm, I'm aware of conversations and it seems that everyone's hopeful that in the spring there would be able to be shows. I think that no one wants to be performing in, on Broadway at least to seats that have empty seats in between with that sort of social distancing vibe that from what I'm hearing, that doesn't seem to be a desired outcome for anyone. It makes the perform performers have to get a different energy from the crowd. It makes the crowd feel a little bit uh, separate separate as well. So I think there might they might wait until there's a situation where we can get a lot of people into seats again, maybe fall of next year. I can't imagine it happening before then. There's gonna, I mean, that's, that's a great conversation that all of us could sit and talk about for hours and hypothesize what it could be more airflow in theaters, uh, mask. I, I, does everyone want to go and sit in row GG and wear a mask while you're watching act three of a long play? I don't know, it's, it's tough. <laughs> but we got to, you know, you got to be smart first. You got to be smart for each other. The yeah, Broadway people know the flu season comes through and wipes out casts, cast will drop, you know, like flies, one person will get the regular influenza flu and it'll like rip through 15 cast members. There'll be musicals that have standbys and playing multiple parts because too many people have yes. had to call out from shows. So, it, you know, yeah. they know from that. Uh, granted, COVID is a different conversation, but that would be my speculation would probably be fall of next year. So there are a couple of questions, a couple of themes that came up over and over again that I'll just pose to all of you. A number of people are kind of curious about your cultural diets at this point. Uh, Andrew from Florida asks how you're staying inspired and, and finding comfort. Okay. And Randy asks, do you have any works that have meant a lot to you this year besides a piece of theater or a book or a podcast? Um, who wants to start? Ooh. What are you watching, listening to? What's keeping you like engaged? Um, I've been laughing. I've been wanting to laugh. And so I've been watching Schitt's Creek, which I didn't watch with regularity. And I was behind. My husband watched the whole thing and loved it. And I'm on season four, episode three. And I'm just, I'm so pleased that it, that that story gets to be told. So I've been sort of been watching, binge watching comedy more than anything and reading a lot of murder mysteries. My baby. I got a little one. <laughs> so I've been watching her grow and she just started walking and um, just getting to spend time with her and watch her develop and take that in. You know, a part of what, a lot of what we do is imagination and creativity and discovery. And so getting to live through her um, is just been so exciting as a mom, especially, but as an artist too, I'm just like stealing all the goodness from her. <laughs> Um, I, I would say the same thing. Um, I have uh, the three, almost four-year-old. Um, I have older kids too, but uh, uh, they've been pretty self-sufficient. But being at home on a 
regular basis for the three-year-old has been, I, I know, a joy for her and having um, mom and dad to direct on a daily basis has, has been a big joy for her. But um, and for her, <laughs> I, we gave birth to a director, which is kind of horrifying for two actors to give birth to a director, but we absolutely did. So that's, that's, our, <laughs> that's our cross to bear. <laughs> but um, there's a, a podcast that I, um, that came out a couple of years ago, but I just started re-listening to it um, uh, called uh, Uncivil uh, by uh, Jindrai uh, Kumanyika. And it's um, just, it's a, uh, it was a podcast. Uh, Jack Hitt also did it, but it, it's um, the official version of the Civil War that we kind of always hear they turned it on its head and we're getting other stories about like black female, former enslaved women, uh, women that ended up enlisting in the army, but pretending to be men or, or uh, slaves that ran away mm -hmm. or, or um, story. one former slave who ended up becoming a spy in Jefferson Davis's house and was passing secrets to the union mm -hmm. army by, by re becoming a slave again and going in and working in his house for his wife. And no one realized that she was sneaking out secrets about what the Confederate army was doing to the, to the, un to the Union army to help them defeat. Um, wow. So things like that. And that, so that's that podcast on civil that I've just been listening to. And it's, it's been fascinating, fascinating and eye opening and stories that again, you know, narratives and stories that we don't necessarily know that, um, open your eyes and educate you. So that's my little pitch for that. Right. Jesse, do you want to? I was never a podcast. I was never a podcast person before. And now I'm really getting into it. I'm about I, to download I, it I'm now. Spending, yeah, I'm spending a lot of time in our apartment. Um, I try to get out as much as I can. But even as I'm doing things around the apartment, I'll, I'll just put one on. And it's just, I got really stuck on one, um, I think, also, it started a couple of years ago. It's called The Confessional um, by a, a, a writer. And at one point, I don't know if she still is. She was a pastor. Nadia Boltzweber is her name. And it's it's fascinating. She literally just has people come and be like, all right, you're in The Confessional. What do you want to talk about? And people tell these stories about something wow. they're either ashamed of that they did in their life or the way they treated people. And then she's, she's really big about... Um, uh, grace and sort of redemptive power and it's fascinating to hear these people talk these things through and 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 to hear a very uh compassionate ear just sort of like release release these things that people that i've never told anyone this um that's fascinating uh i've watched all of the home edit i know danielle got to kneel before i did she was like i saw your episode oh, how God, is the playroom crazy. home edit people come on come on over to the house <laughs> Watch it, contain it, edit it. No, edit it, contain it, something. Um, so there's been a lot of organization. I think I've cleaned most of the closets and recleaned the closets. Um, yeah, a lot of lot of cooking. A lot of my, I, I, I think especially in the beginning, I didn't feel like I was being very creative. And then I was like, oh, I'm just using my creative. I just have different creative outlets now. It's, it's nesting, it's home stuff, and it's like a ton of cooking. I'm, I haven't cooked this much probably since I, I lived in Chicago for years before I came to New York. And um, then I came to New York and I was like, oh, you can get food anywhere at any time. Here, just order it. So um, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of cooking, a lot of cooking in our household and I'm loving it. So believe it or not, we have time for one more question. I'm going to make it a broad one to kind of let you take it where you will. Um, obviously, we're going through a pandemic. We're having this uh, industry-wide and national discussion about equity and diversity. Uh, there are so many challenges facing the theater world. Uh, and then there's the, the streaming, the variety of streaming experiments that we're all seeing unfold, the innovation that's taking place because there's no live performance. What, how do you think Broadway will be different when it does come back? Stumped us. Stumped. Well, I guess. No. Go ahead, Audra. No, I'm saying I'm stumped. <laughs> you answer it. Oh, um, I guess the thing that, that popped into my mind is um, sometimes we have this conversation about like then and now, and well, why don't I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the things we're experiencing now, some of the like you said, the, the tools or the the 
the sites or the apps that we're using now won't be um, incorporated more in in the realm of live theater, like whether there will be a time when you can, or a certain number of tickets that will be released for a streaming purposes, um, which I don't know, maybe can help diversify the audience and that it won't, it won't just be, I guess I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a little bit of a meshing from what we're experiencing now with what we were experiencing to kind of make a new, a new animal. I mean, I wouldn't ever want to do away with the live aspect of it. I think that's, but maybe there's a way to, to incorporate some of the streaming as well to, to just kind of like add to the pool and bring people more. I love it. I think it's going to be so, I think it's going to come with a fire and a vim that has, I feel like the streaming stuff that's happening now has been so appreciated and fantastic that the National Theatre in London, that, that, Broadway HD, places like this are allowing now more content to be seen in your home. My kids who are 10, they, you know, watching Hamilton on Disney Plus multiple times. I mean, they have friends over and they watch it sections. I mean, they're learning internal rhyme, they're learning history, they're learning, they're singing. It's like spectacular, right? And I feel like that breeds an appreciation for it. But I think when we're able to get back on stage, when you're able to get back in a theater, I think there's going to be like this fire, this like oh, yeah. horniness to produce and to and to suck it up and to take it in because it's it's missed in a way that that is church. It's missed in a way that is more than this because you don't have to share the belief. You can just experience the experience the experience so i'm excited for it i think when it does happen it's gonna be gangbusters it w i think it would be also i think maybe what would pe maybe some people producers or or you know theater owners or content owners whoever are realizing too we got to make sure that every show is preserved in some way so mm. that it can be available um because Maybe, hopefully, we're going to learn from this pandemic, uh, but it may not be, it's definitely not going to be the only pandemic. I mean, this is, you know, this is just... That's a good call. Do you know what they're going to do? They're, aren't they doing the Tony Awards in October yeah, or something? But, I, yeah. but how did they, did they record all of the musicals from the season? Like how, part of the Tonys is showing the numbers from the shows, right? right. Half of them haven't, weren't, hadn't even... Right. Them, but I do think... Yeah, it didn't get to open. Yeah, so there's going to be, I would hope, um, an, an understanding that we absolutely must preserve every mm. everything that gets done live, mm. so that we have we we do have it, so that a, a it, it, we will have it, and if we go into these times again, we can have it to stream, but more so that it can reach as many people as possible. I understand that there are financial ramifications to doing that, but there's got to be some way. Mm. So that yeah, Danielle, I mean the Mets been doing it for years. Yep, yeah. right. Danielle, what's in your crystal ball? To, I just want to see more diversity in the theater. That to me would be a magical, like, you know, it's called the Great White Way. And it started out being called that because of the electric white lights that were made up Broadway, but it's taken on another name. And I would love to like step into seeing an August Wilson or seeing some check off and be like, yo, it ain't just five of us here. Like that to me would be everything. <laughs> um, because like Neil was saying, like the, the beautiful thing about theater is we don't have to, you don't have to feel um, connected to a piece of art just because someone you know on stage looks exactly like you and has the exact same story that you had growing up that does not that's not what like, that that's not the only only uh beautiful juice that comes from this theater that the beautiful part is that we all are so freaking different and because i'm different you can see something in me that you've never gotten to see and never gotten to experience mm -hmm. and see yourself mm -hmm. and that's what like i love about the theater and i want i know we'll stay um you know that that part will not be lost but i just hope that it blossoms and we get to experience that and share that with more people. 
Well, that's an inspiring note on which to end. I'm so sorry to say this, but we are out of time. Before we go, I just want to thank our panelists, Danielle Brooks, Neil Patrick Harris, Audra McDonald, and Jesse Mueller, as well, of course, as Hillary Rodham Clinton and all of you who joined us. You can watch previous episodes of Offstage and sign up for more digital New York Times events at timesevents.nytimes.com. I wish all of you uh, health and safety and good night. <laughs>